Well, good morning. My name is Kevin. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at Genesis. I'm excited to be here with you this morning. Thanks for joining us today, both those of you who are in the auditorium with us, and thanks for joining us, uh, those of you who are joining online. You know, one of the things you may be surprised to learn about me is that in my younger years, I was a little bit of a risk taker, uh, much more than I am today. When I was 19 years old, I jumped off a 10-story building. Okay, well, it wasn't a building. It was actually a platform. Uh, I was on vacation in Florida, and a buddy and I decided to go bungee jumping. Anybody ever been bungee jumping? Raise your hand. No one in here. All right. Wow, I'm, I feel special. Uh, well, the platform was about 100 feet in the air, and when I stepped onto that platform and they strapped that harness on me, in that moment, I grabbed that harness with both hands and I held on tight. And all I can remember thinking is, I hope this harness works, right? I think I remember turning to the guy next to me like, this isn't your first day today, is it? Like, you know what you're doing here, don't you? And they have you step to the edge of the platform. And when you do, the platform actually tilts forward a little bit. And so there you are, uh, you're standing 10 stories up and I'm leaning over the edge with all of my faith and all of my trust in that moment in this harness, in this cord, trusting that they're going to work. And then you take the leap of faith. Well, today we're gonna look at a story of faith. We're in a series called Knowing Jesus. And for the last several weeks, we've been looking at a series of stories in the life and ministry of Jesus. And here's what we're gonna see in today's story. Today, we're gonna see that faith comes from trusting in the promises of Jesus. If you have your Bibles, open to John chapter four, John chapter four. And as you go there, uh, I wanna pray for us and pray for our time together. Let me pray. Father, I'm thankful for today. I'm thankful for this church family. I'm thankful for your love for us and your care for us. I'm thankful for your word. And I trust that you have something to say to each one of us, those of us who are here in the auditorium, those, of, those who are watching and joining online. God, I just ask that you would open our eyes today, that as we read your word, that it would be living and active and that you would open our ears and help us to hear what you have to say to us today, Jesus. Would you glorify your name in the next few minutes? Amen. Amen. Well, let's pick up our story today in John chapter 4, verse 46. John 46. John 4, 46. Once more he visited Cana in Galilee. This is Jesus. Once more Jesus visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. So John sets the scene of the story for us. Jesus returns to Cana where he had turned water into wine earlier in his ministry. We looked at that several weeks ago. John tells us there's a royal official with a sick son. And this man is likely a Roman citizen, probably serving in Herod's court in Capernaum. And as a royal official, he is a man with power and influence. He has some wealth and resources. He has some level of success and achievement under his belt. But this man has come to realize something that so many of us have also realized. There are some needs in our life that no amount of wealth or resources can meet. He has a precious son who is sick. And as we'll see in just a minute, he's so sick that he's close to death. You know, nothing will drop a parent to his or her knees like a sick child. If you have a child who's gone through a health crisis, it is humbling. You don't have to be a parent to recognize that. When your child gets sick or they get hurt in some way, you quickly realize how helpless and powerless you really are in life. And this man has a sick son and, and, and he's desperate for help. So let's pick it up. John 4, uh, verse 47. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. So news that Jesus has arrived in Cana has, has obviously spread to Capernaum. Now, Capernaum is about 20 miles away from Cana. And so word has reached Cana and has reached this man that Jesus, the miracle worker, is back in town. Now, as a royal official, as a Roman royal official, he would have had access to the best medical care that Rome could have provided. And yet, despite all of his money and his influence, despite great medical care there in Rome, he, uh, in, in the Roman world, he couldn't, he couldn't heal his son. He couldn't save his son. 
And so why not try the Jewish carpenter, the miracle worker from Nazareth? You know, when you're desperate for help, you'll try anything, won't you? One commentator writes this. Here is a royal official, a man of high standing, stooping down to seek the help of a lowly carpenter from Nazareth. And so he comes to Jesus and he begs him to heal his son. He begged. The the word there says that he repeated, he asked again and again and again. You can just picture this father desperately throwing himself at Jesus's feet, begging him to come save his dying son. You know, this is, This is kind of what causes many of us to turn to Jesus for the very first time. You have a significant need in your life that you can't meet. And no matter how hard you try, no matter what you do, you don't have the power to deal with it. You try everything else and then you think, well, I might as well try God. I might as well turn to Jesus for help. And so you come to Jesus wondering if he can help save some part of your life. Maybe it's a broken marriage that you can't fix. Maybe it's an addiction that you just can't break. Maybe it's a financial hole that you can't dig yourself out of. Maybe it's a mistake that you just can't go back and undo. Maybe it's a decision that you can't seem to make. Or maybe it's just an an emptiness inside, a lack of inner peace. There's a restlessness in your soul and you just can't shake it. And so you turn to Jesus with some small amount of hope and faith that he can help you. So for many of us, this is how our journey with Jesus begins. But if you've been a Christian for a while, you may need to be reminded today that what brings you to Jesus is also what helps you follow Jesus. Author Paul Miller in his book, A Praying Life, writes this, we received Jesus because we were weak and that's how we also follow him. We forget that helplessness is how the Christian life works. So Christians, we're to let our weaknesses and our helplessness lead us back to Jesus every single day. So if you're anything like me and you're feeling overwhelmed in this season of life, let it lead you to Jesus. If you're feeling overwhelmed by all of the mask wearing and the social distancing, by the protest, by the riots, the hate on social media, the conspiracies, the politics, the economy, the uncertainty with schools, Listen, let all, if all of that is taking a toll on you and you're thinking to yourself, I can't deal with this anymore. It's two things. First, you're not alone. We all have felt that to some degree. And second, you're right. You can't handle this on your own. You can't deal with it. We weren't designed to. None of us can because we, life is out of our control. We are much more powerless and helpless than we'd like to admit. So allow your overwhelming thoughts and feelings lead you back to Jesus. Okay, so this guy turns to Jesus and he begs him for help. Let's see how Jesus responds. Verse 48. Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. Wait, what? (laughs) I mean, think about this man. Here's this man who is desperate. He's urgent for help. He's seeking this, he has this urgency. He's He's seeking Jesus for help. He has this need in his life and And he comes to Jesus, begging him to come help him. And then Jesus, this is how Jesus responds. It seems a bit aloof, right? It seems a little bit insensitive at first. Like, come on, Jesus, what what kind of response is that? Well, the phrase you people here is plural. And Jesus is not not only uh, addressing this man, he's likely addressing a crowd of people that has gathered around to watch with anticipation how Jesus is gonna respond with this man's need. Remember, they're in Cana. And so word probably spread that Jesus had turned water into wine. Many of these people were told earlier in the the text that, that, uh, that they were up in Jerusalem for the Passover and they saw what Jesus did there. They saw him clear out the temple court, temple courts. And so they're wondering what's Jesus, the miracle worker gonna do next? Let's imagine what this kind of scene may have looked like, okay? Back in uh, 2012, when I went to Israel, we were walking through Bethlehem and I looked up and I saw this. Stars and Bucks Cafe. <laughs> Don't you love that? And so there they are. There's Stars and Bucks in, in Bethlehem right there. And so isn't that great? So maybe Jesus is sitting in Stars and Bucks, okay? And he's having a cup of coffee and word spreads and dozens of people show up and they're spilling outside the store. 
They're eager and excited to see, curious to know what's Jesus going to do next. And suddenly a man shows up. He runs through the door. He pushes his way through the crowd. He throws himself at Jesus' feet and he starts begging him, please come heal my son. He's about to die. And maybe people in the crowd start to turning to one another and whispering, I wonder what the miracle worker is going to do next. I can't wait to see what he's going to do. Jesus overhears them saying this and he says, he looks up maybe and says, unless you people see signs and wonders, you're never going to believe. And he kind of shakes his head. The apostle John emphasized signs and wonders throughout his gospel account. Because signs and wonders, the wonders and signs that Jesus performed, the miracles that he did were designed to serve as evidence. Evidence that would lead people to put their faith in Jesus as the son of God. Now, if you're not yet a Christ follower yet, but you're wanting to learn more about Jesus, you're exploring Christianity maybe, wanting evidence is a healthy part of that journey. It's a healthy part of the journey toward faith in Jesus. You just don't want to stop at the evidence. Author Josh McDowell wrote a classic apologetic book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And in it, he walks the reader through a a series of different uh, categories of evidence for Jesus. And you need to know that the Christian faith is based on solid evidence, but at some point, the evidence demands a verdict. Because if you're not careful, you can fall into this seeing is believing kind of faith. You need Jesus to do something for you in order to have faith. This seems to be the kind of faith that this crowd has in Jesus. They wanna see him do something miraculous. And so Jesus kind of corrects them and rebukes them. He's not being rude or harsh. He's actually doing the loving thing because Jesus doesn't want this crowd uh, or this father or us for that matter to place our faith in evidence because the evidence is ultimately designed to lead us to faith in Jesus. Well, the father hears the challenge and here's how he responds. Verse 49, the royal official said, sir, come down before my child dies. This can be translated, sir, come down before my little boy dies. He persists. And here's how Jesus responds. Verse 50, go, Jesus, go, Jesus replied, your son will live. Go, your son will live. This father has been asking Jesus to come with him, right? But now Jesus kind of flips it around and says, no, you go on home, your son will live. Why don't you imagine with me this, moment, this, this, this dilemma that this father must be in and what he must feel in this moment. Does he demand more evidence from Jesus at this point? Does he ask for some kind of proof that his son will live? Or does he just, is he just supposed to take Jesus at his word and go? One author writes this, Jesus created a dilemma of faith. If the father refused to return to Capernaum without taking Jesus with him, he would show that he did not believe Jesus's word and consequently would receive no benefit because of his distrust in Jesus. On the other hand, if he followed Jesus's order, he would be returning to the dying boy without any outward assurance that the lad would recover. He was forced to make the difficult choice between insisting on evidence and thus showing disbelief or exercising faith without any tangible proof to encourage him. This is the dilemma of faith. Isn't this the dilemma of faith that we as Christians face on a daily basis? We have to choose who or what are we going to put our faith in? Where do we place our faith? Will we put our faith and trust in Jesus and his promises? Will this guy trust Jesus in his promise? Let's see. Verse 50. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. So he takes Jesus at his word and he leaves. He heads back home. And imagine what this journey home must have been like. He's headed back home without Jesus. That's what he came for. The only thing he has are four simple words. Your son will live. That's all he's got. I don't know about you, but if I was that guy, if I, if I was this father in that moment, I would have took out a piece of pen, a pen and a piece of paper and said, okay, Jesus, what's the plan? Your son will live. That's it. That's all I got. And I'd take that paper, I'd have held it in my hand and all the way home, I'm clutching that. And I'm sure I'd be pulling it out and reading it over and over again on my way home thinking, your son will live. This is all I've got. All I've got, all my hope, all my faith, all my trust, my whole life is resting in four simple words, in one simple promise. And so the father heads home, holding on to nothing more than the promise of Jesus. Verse 51, while he was still on the way, his servants met him. Let's pause right here. He's on his way home and he looks up and his servants 
are coming towards him from a distance. You gotta imagine that this man in this moment thinks to himself, they're bringing me bad news. They're coming to tell me that my son is dead. I, I gotta imagine that maybe he falls to the ground at that moment, maybe goes to his knees and he's thinking to himself, don't tell me, don't tell me. But then he looks up. As they get closer, he can begin to see the expression on their face. And he can see they have smiles on their face. They have this disposition of joy. There's this hope in their eyes. They, they have this excitement because they show up and here's what they say. They met him with the news that his boy was living. Some translations say that his boy was alive, that his boy recovered. The father inquires, when he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and his whole household believed. Isn't that awesome? That's our story for today. A man turns to Jesus, begs him for help. Jesus gives him one command and one promise. The father obeys Jesus and he heads home with only one thing in his hands, four simple words. His son is healed. And notice that his faith grows, right? He first comes with a little bit of faith, believing that Jesus could help. And then he has the faith to at least take Jesus at his word and head home. And eventually his faith takes root and he shares his faith with his family and his whole household and family believes. Now, here's the question I want us to answer for the rest of our, with a, the time we have left. Why did the apostle John include this story in his gospel? It's not because it was just a cool story about Jesus. John included this story because this man is an example of the kind and quality of faith that God wants for you and for me. Let's go back to the climax, the kind of the turning point of the story. It is verse 50. This time I want to look at the ESV translation. John 4:50 in the ESV reads this. Jesus said to him, "Go, your son will live." The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. This is the point of the story right here. This is the message of the story. And I want to highlight this one phrase, believed. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went home. The word for believed here is the Greek word pistuo. It's an important word. It's the most important word in this whole story. And here's why. The apostle John uses this word 98 times throughout his whole gospel. In fact, if you had to summarize the gospel of John in a single word, it would be the word believe, pastuo. And the reason is because this is the kind of faith that John was trying to tell us as the readers that Jesus longs for us to have. Webster's dictionary defines believe like this. To believe means to accept or regard something as true. And pastuo means to accept or regard something as true, but it means much more than that. The word is a verb, not a noun. Here's what I mean by this. Follow me here. Pistuo, pistuo belief is not a decision of belief in the past, but it's an ongoing act of believing. It's a belief that is living and active today. So for example, if you've ever flown in an airplane, you made a decision at that point in time to get on the, on the plane believing by faith in the law of aerodynamics. You believe that the plane was safe, that the pilots knew what they were doing. And so you exercised your belief or faith by stepping on and flying. But if you never fly in an airplane again, then your belief in the law of aerodynamics and your belief in airplanes is a past tense noun belief. Meaning you can say you believe in the law of aerodynamics, but if you don't have to exercise that faith in an active ongoing daily basis, then it's a noun, not a verb. On the other hand, if you take medication every day in order to stay alive, then your belief or your faith in medication is a living, ongoing, active faith and believing every day. For example, individuals who are organ transplant recipients, say you needed a heart transplant and you receive a new heart, you have to take medication every day for the rest of your life in order to suppress your immune system so your immune system doesn't attack your heart and so that you don't die. So every day when you take that medication, you are taking that medication in faith, in pastuo belief. It's an active, ongoing, life-giving faith every day. This is the kind of faith and the quality of faith, if you will, that God calls us to, 
And this is the whole reason why John wrote his entire gospel. In fact, towards the end of his gospel, John actually summarizes his whole book for us. In John chapter 20, verse 31, here's what he writes. He says, these things are written. Every story I wrote in my gospel, the story of the royal official son, these things are written. I wrote this so that you may believe, pastuo, that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Our story today is a great example of a man who had pastuo belief in Jesus. And that's the kind of belief that leads to eternal life. Now, what is eternal life? Eternal life doesn't begin when you die. You don't believe in Jesus just to get a ticket to heaven when you die. So when you die, then you take your ticket and you use it and you give it to Jesus and then you get to go into heaven. No, eternal life is heaven coming into your life the minute you believe in Jesus. Eternal life is heaven coming and living in you today, influencing every part of your life. You can have eternal life today, living in you, influencing you every day. You know, the gospel of Jesus Christ is that we've all sinned. We've all turned away from God and separated from God. We are dead in our sins. We are are on a path to spend eternity separated from God in a place the Bible calls hell. But here's the good news. God loves us so much that he sent his son, Jesus. And Jesus never sinned. He never turned away from God. He obeyed God all the way to the cross where he died for our sins. He died for your sins and mine. He lived the life we couldn't live and he died the death that we deserved. And John said that for those of us who believe in Jesus, we receive the gift of eternal life. But how do we access that eternal life? How do we, how do we, how does it impact us on a daily tangible basis today? How does it get into our hearts and our lives? It's through faith. Ephesians 2 says it this way, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Listen, there's nothing you can do to earn your salvation. In Christ, your sins are forgiven and your righteousness doesn't matter. You come empty handed to Jesus and by faith you believe in Jesus and it's by grace that he saves you. If you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, if you've never believed, pastuoed in Jesus, I wanna encourage you to do so today. All it takes is just calling on Jesus in prayer and telling him, Jesus, I thank you for dying for my sins. I trust that you are the son of God. And I'm putting all of my faith and my belief in you. I want to have eternal life in you. Now, for those of us who are Christians, we need to be reminded and encouraged that we have access to heaven on a daily basis. And how do we access it? We access it still through faith. Faith comes from trusting in the promises of Jesus every day. Every day we have an opportunity to exercise our faith. We can have a strong faith and experience eternal life every day by trusting in the promises of Jesus. And in this chaotic season of life, we're gonna have to hold on to those promises of Jesus tightly and to clutch them. Just as that father held on to Jesus's promise on his way home. I like how William Barclay describes the kind of faith we need in the promises of Jesus. He says this, it is the very essence of faith that we should believe that what Jesus says is true. So often we have a kind of vague, nebulous, wistful longing that the promises of Jesus are true. But the only way we really enter into them, catch this, this is important. The only way you really enter into the promises or another way to say this, the only way the promises of Jesus enter into your life and impact you and impact and influence your attitude and your response to the world and your thinking and how you relate to people and how you relate to God. The only way the promises of Jesus are gonna enter into your life and impact you and help you on a daily basis is to believe in them with the clutching intensity of a drowning man. We've all seen those images of someone who is drowning in the middle of the ocean, right? And a helicopter comes to rescue them and they lower the cable down with a life jacket or a a flotation device of some kind. And the individual in the water, what they do, they grab onto that thing and they hold onto that thing. And in that moment, their whole life is resting and trusting and clutching that device. Their faith is in it to save them. Listen, don't hold on to your plans. Don't hold on to your job or your 401k or your bank account. 
Don't hold on to your political party. Don't hold on to your health. Don't hold on to anything other than the promises of God. That's all we have to hold on to. Now, practically speaking, this means you're going to have to get into God's word. You're going to have to open up the Bible. You have to read through the Gospels and the New Testament. It may be a good idea to do a word study on the promises of God. Make a list and start reading through them and praying them every day. I want to end this morning by just looking at a few of those promises. Let's allow some of the promises of Jesus to renew our minds and encourage our hearts here this morning. First, John 16, 33. I have told you these things, Jesus says, so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. I see two promises here. Number one, Jesus promises that in this world, we're gonna have trouble. We should not be surprised. We should not be shaken. We should not be caught off guard. He promised us we're gonna have trouble in this world. But then he made a great pro another promise here. I have overcome the world. Our faith is in him. We do not need to be shaken. Jesus has overcome the world. Matthew chapter six, Jesus tells us this. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or drink or about your body or what you will wear is not life more than food and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns and yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying at a single hour to your life? Number one, a promise from Jesus. You are valuable to God. Number two, worrying does nothing good for you. Let's continue. He goes on. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Jesus promises us, the only thing worth seeking in this world is him and his kingdom and his righteousness. And he also promises us that he'll take care of us. He'll meet our needs. Matthew 28, Jesus, wrote, Jesus said this, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Number one, we still have a mission. Jesus is not in heaven social distancing. He's not waiting for the virus to end. Jesus is still working today. He's still wanting to bring people to faith in him. He's still wanting Christians to grow in him. He still wants you and me to live on mission and to make disciples. And he promises us that he'll be with us, that he'll never leave us and he'll forsake us. In John 14, Jesus writes, do not let your, uh, Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to be, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you will be where also where I am. My kids and I looked at this the other day. By the way, shout out to my kids. I said, kids, do you know that Jesus promises that for those who put their faith and trust in Christ, that those who are in Christ, that he is preparing a room for us in heaven? Here's another promise. This world is not our home. We do not need to get comfortable and settle down and want things to go back to normal. This world is not our home. Our home is in heaven. And Jesus promises one day he's gonna come back and he's gonna take us home to be with him. That's what we're looking forward to. That's what our hope is on. That's where our eyes need to look up and gaze at. Lastly, Jesus says this in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God promises us that he loves you and he loves me. And he loved us so much that he sent his son, that Jesus left heaven and came to earth. And he promises us this, that whoever believes in him, whoever puts their faith and trust in him has eternal life. And we can experience that kind of life right here and right now if we will trust in his promises. You know, the funny thing, funny thing about the uh, bungee jump story is that after I jumped once, my buddy and I, we had so much fun, we went back and got in line, got in line and we jumped again. We jumped twice in a row. Now, I would never bungee jump again today. I would never do that today because at 43 years old, I'm thinking, I don't trust that harness and that cord. It's not worth it. 
but I trust in the promises of Jesus. Let's believe these promises, church family. Let's hold on to the promises of Jesus and clutch onto them every day. Let's believe them by faith and let's experience the eternal life that God has for us every single day. Let's pray. Father, I'm so thankful for the promises of Jesus. God, would you help us believe? I think about the, we believe, help our unbelief. Increase our faith in your promises, Jesus. We wanna be a people who are not shaken by the things of this world. We wanna be a church family who stands firm and secure on your word, on your commands, on your promises. They're the only thing that we can hold on to. And so we just declare today as a church family, we are holding on to you, Jesus, to you and your promises. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.